this. So again, um, I want to welcome you back. So see, technology has made many things possible. And uh, in order for you to be successful, we must understand how technology is changing. And not only changing as to benefit us, but how the society is changing along with the technology. So I know many of these things are not told to you before, but let's see how we can study this. And for today's discussion, I have with you a very favorite book of mine, but I have not read this book. I have only uh, read somebody who is discussing this book in another way. So this book is by Frank Heinemann Knight, K-N-I-G-H-T. Uncertainty, Risk, Uncertainty and Profit. It was published in 1921. So what would be uh, most interesting for any any of you who is a student or who is going to take their competitive exams or anything even if you are going to take a decision about where to invest or where to spend your time in different ways then this possibility will be in your mind am I doing right am I uh, possibly learning something about myself or where my uh, learning is helping me and is it harming me should i do something new should i know uh, should i note something from others should i copy others should i be a little careful in whom i make friends with so all these things are part of your life okay so let's see friends what uh, mr frank knight i will teach us today So, minor prerequisites for perfect competition, chapter 6. In part 2, we have attempted an analytical construction of a perfectly competitive society with a view to determining the precise meaning of the theoretical tendencies of a private property, free exchange organization of society, and especially the conditions necessary to the realization of those tendencies. The abstract conditions first enumerated in chapter 3 represented in part divergences in degree only from real life and were in part arbitrary abstractions from fundamental characteristics of the pecuniary organization made for the purpose of a separate study of the constituent elements. Those of the later type have been dealt with in chapters 4 and 5 and the result up to the present point is an outline picture of the essentials of a perfect competitive system. The first rather preliminary objective of the study has thus been achieved as far as the author is prepared or feels it advisable to go. The second and more fundamental purpose is to construct this ideal perfect competition with the facts of ordinary life to examine the limitations of the general principles involved and to inquire as to the directions in which they must be supplemented supplemented by detailed empirical data before completely applicable conclusions can be drawn. I know you may feel confused by listening to this. Let's see what is the footnote here. There is one important exception to this statement. And as observed in chapters 1 and 2, the presence of uncertainty uncertainty in regard to individual events does not necessarily obstruct the workings of competition or prevent the realization of its theoretical result in a remainderless distribution of the product of industry among the productive agents. If the uncertainty in a particular case is measurable, it may in effect be eliminated by, eliminated by the grouping or clubbing of a sufficient number of cases to secure certainty in regard to the group. This point cannot be dealt, dealt with until after the general theory of risk has been presented. Let's see. Okay. So first he's going to talk about what are the mi uh, minor 
conditions or minor premises for perfect competition and then he is going to discuss what are the theory of risk and incertainty but it is not the intention to cover this field with any great degree of exhaustiveness only one of the theoretical simplifications is to be studied in detail the assumption of perfect knowledge part 3 of the essay will be devoted to a discussion of the meaning and consequences of uncertainty the incompleteness and inaccuracy of the beliefs and opinions upon which economic conduct is based but it is desirable to have as a background some brief notice of the other obstructed factors so here you know he is talking of how there are resource uh, like perfect knowledge and everyone has a perfect knowledge i think so well, this is what he means but uh, uh, economic conduct is related to the beliefs and opinions okay so let's see then later it will readily uh, readily be seen that many of the objections to the pure theory of distribution commented upon in chapter 4 relate to these necessary scientific idealizations and have real significance as limitations on the completeness and accuracy of the generalizations of theory. They are not therefore valid objections to the theory and have been advanced as such only because of the common failure to comprehend the nature of scientific reasoning, the meaning and use of general principles. The assumption of continuous variability in the magnitude of all factors dealt with. The question of the size of the marginal unit. Okay. Uh, let's see the footnote specifications number two and five in chapter three that people are perfectly rational and that there is perfect intercommunication among them are clearly phases of the problem of perfect knowledge to be taken up in part three in the present chapter we are concerned especially with numbers three and four formal freedom of action and perfect mobility implying perfect divisibility six and seven the absence of monopoly and predation. Numbers 8, 9, 10, and 11 have already been considered, but some further remarks will be in place to regard in regard to the first point mentioned under number 8. The relations of social as contrasted with contrasted with individual wants. We may note here that the timelessness of the production process necessary to secure perfect mobility has been dealt with in one aspect in chapter 4. In addition, it retards the speed of readjustments by holding productive forces committed to certain uses for an interval after it would otherwise be profitable for them to change. But it does not affect the final results, the character of adjustment when achieved. Some discussion of the intermediate effects, effects is necessary in connection with the study of profits and the whole subject of friction will be gone into after the treatment of uncertainty has cleared the way for a discussion of profit clearly relative to that of the flexibility of industrial organization and the two must be considered together then we give up the illicit procedure of funding productive agents into factors and deal with the actual competing units on their own account and this problem becomes of practical significance and constitutes an effective limitation on the application of the theory in the case of labor specific especially with which we are here particularly concerned the human individual is a very effective unit not only does he bark in as a unit but he cannot practically be divided up between different establishments and the range of occupations in which he can engage in any short interval of time is also very narrowly restricted he may also be in a high and surprising degree unique he does not always shade off by imperceptible gradations from one variety to another by the extent that perfect competitive impedition demands. His numbers in proportion to the number of variants are not merely always so large as to make an individual a negligible fraction of a group of similars. So all these things are sounding very vague right now, but we will have opportunity to clarify all these things as we go along so i beg your patience and thank you for allowing me to speak for so long